Welcome everybody. Welcome to another edition of How I Do It. Today we welcome back Dr. Vincent Hoggle from the Lindau Spine Hospital. And this is a follow-up video to his resection of an intradural tumor endoscopically. And today we're going to focus on how you close the dura endoscopically. So welcome Dr. Hoggle. How are you? Welcome, Paul. Thanks for having me again. I'm, I'm doing great. And uh, we have another excellent topic to talk about since this is uh, certainly something that uh, has been, yeah, not illuminated that well over the past years, in my opinion. And so we, we have some exciting news, I would think. Great. So, so tell us what you, what you got here. All right. Now, that was uh, a patient with a central stenosis at the level L4-5. So I did a decompression with the elasis delta system. And right now we're looking from medial to lateral. I'm making use of this 15 degree off axis view to where we are looking from medial outside towards the lateral recess, which usually is a big benefit because you can nicely uh, remove these last pieces of yellow ligament out there of facet joint under great visual control. But what obviously happened in between was a dural tear, which you see right down here below this fat tissue. And you see in just a second, a fascicle and this uh, yeah, blood vessel right around it. Mm -hmm. And obviously it happened uh, where I didn't notice it, but uh, still it is a fairly small dural tear to where you can see the fascicle itself right there, but it's not really pushing far out of the uh, defect. And therefore in such cases, it's usually not necessary to do anything. Now, the big benefit of performing a procedure endoscopically is that, of course, you have a very minimal approach trauma, which means that there's not really a big hole on the way down there. And on the other hand, there is also very little space for CSF to find its way up to the skin. And of course, that is the, the big problem of a dural tear that you have CSF reaching up to the skin and possibly causing an infection. So you're not And, and usually... also, you know, again, if the large dural tear, you worry about a pseudomeningocele formation. So exactly. I know in my training, my, uh, my chairman would always say uh, that when he dies, his ep epitaph on his gravestone should be he closed the dura. So he really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's very, very true. So this is, uh, an example, obviously of a dural tear to where we see the neural structure right beneath it, but it still more or less stays in place. So this is a dural tear where you can consider just doing nothing because again, I have little concern about CSF reaching up to the skin. And also, since your defect overall is very small, there is not that much CSF being lost outside of the dura, uh, which, of course, with bigger amounts of it, you have the typical symptoms like uh, persisting headaches. But uh, I wouldn't be worried about that in that case here. OK, so this is uh, another case where I did also a decompression at the level four or five we have more or less a similar view. We are looking from medial to lateral. Here we see the uh, L5 root down here running into the lateral recess. So we're again looking from medial to lateral to have a better view down into the lateral recess. And again, what happened right here is a dural tear, obviously. Uh, and we see another fascicle right beneath it. I mean, it's of course a nice view here into the uh, intradural space, but here you do see the fascicle coming out of this defect, at least to some extent, to where in this case, I wasn't that sure about not closing it uh, or not being worried about not closing it. So after finishing the decompression right around the defect, I uh, 
use some Tacho seal uh, to put over it. For me, it was too small to, to do a suture or even thinking about converting to microsurgery to suture it. Therefore, I, as a compromise, tried to place this Tacho seal on it. So for the U.S. Uh, viewers, Taco Seal is is what? Is this a bovine collagen sponge? Right, right. That's what it is. Okay. So but, And also it, just reminding the viewers for, for scale, um, while as you get close to it and you look at it, it looks like a very big defect. You're looking, you know, the foot plate of your um, kerosene, I think, is only a couple of millimeters. Uh, right. And so right. that's really a, maybe three to four millimeters at most. Yeah, yeah, that's what I would guess too. Yeah. So here now, we're trying to put that little pledge of the taco seal in there. Right now, ideally, I try to place the the first piece inside the dura, so it more or less closes from the inside. So whenever CSF is pushing against it, it pushes it against the defect uh, to have this first inner layer of uh, closure, but but you can Obviously. actually see a little bubble of arachnoid there uh, in that view, yeah. which is, an, again, incredible to see. Because if you're thinking about it, you get CSF trying to come out with the arachnoid, and then you've got some water pressure going in, and that sort of people are always worried about. You get a dural tear, you get ingress of saline. And here's a perfect mm -hmm. example of that. That obviously isn't happening because the CSF, well, the arachnoid is actually bulging out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now... Uh, yeah, I'm trying to, to place this first piece on the inside. It, of course, has to be bigger than the defect itself. So once CSF pushes it against the inner surface of the Dura, it, it to some extent closes it, which in this case did work. Obviously, it's, it's it takes a few minutes to get that established, but obviously it did work. And I think that just makes it more effective than just placing uh, a layer on the outside. Mm -hmm. Because now you can already see that uh, by placing this on the inside, CSF, the pressure from the CSF is, is pushing it against the, the inner surrounding around this defect. And that already, to some extent, right there closes it because now you see the Dura is pulsating again, uh, which it didn't do to that extent beforehand. And so once I've placed that on the inside, then as you see right here, I take uh, a, a bigger piece and and place that on the outside. Now this this really glues it, it it sticks to the dura. That's that's of course the big benefit compared to to any other hemostatic agent, I guess, like surgical. That this really glues to it, as you see right there. So having placed this inner and outer layer on it, you see now the Dura again nicely pulsating, which is, I guess, a hint to some extent to where it's it's watertight at, at that stage right there. Yeah. Perfect. So beyond just doing nothing and uh, on the other hand, but the defect being small enough to where you don't think about uh, converting to microsurgery, this could be a compromise of, of closing the dura. And this patient, just as the first one, did not complain of any headache uh, either or any other complication. Okay, so this is from your case where you've already removed the intradural tumor and now you got to close the dura and you're going to suture this. Right. Obviously, this uh, defect is too big to where you can think about leaving it like this or putting some, as we've seen earlier, this so-called tacho seal on top of it. This is not sufficient to, to close it, uh, possibly watertight, to where at this uh, stage, of course, I had to think about suturing the dura. Now, uh, as we've mentioned in the How I Do It session about this intradural tumor, uh, I would have been very disappointed to remove this tumor uh, fully endoscopically and then had to convert to micro to the microscope in order to close the dura. So the uh, first step is to, to place these fascicles back inside the dura and also uh, creating a layer of protection before 
uh, starting to to suture. And so you're using simply using your regular pituitary. Right, right. That's a, a regular pituitary that I use right there, which also has the disadvantage that it really only comes together at the very tip while not in the rest of the two branches right there. So I had to really, really get a hold of the needle just at the very tip of these branches in order to be able to control the needle. So this is certainly uh, something where technology has to uh, advance in order to reproducibly effectively be able to, to close the dura under the endoscope with sutures. And so to tie the first knot right there, obviously I tried to use the pituitary and the sectors to get get it done, which eventually did work obviously, but was quite a hassle. So uh, I then talked to the, the nurse in the OR if there's any alternative, any other instrument that she could think of to improve this. And so she brought me this knot pusher from the colleagues from general surgery, which you will see in just a second, which certainly made it much easier. But you, you tied your knot outside of the endoscope and pushed the right, knot down. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, the so I, 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 I brought in the suture through the working channel, uh, took it back out once I placed it down there and then did the knotting outside and used this knot pusher that you see right there from the colleagues from general surgery, which uh, yeah, certainly made it much easier to get that uh, knot placed down there. And so I did that always again, placing this uh, so-called tachosil beneath it, as we've seen just earlier, to try to get a watertight closure of the dura in between the uh, different sutures. And so overall, I placed four of them. This was the third one here at the cranial end. And then yeah, after having placed these three, the distance to me just seemed too far in between those two. So I tried to place a last one in between once again, after I've placed this patch here on the inside. Now, it, it did take me about 40 minutes overall to place these different patches and do the four sutures right there. But that did include the learning curve, obviously, to where at the very beginning using these pituitaries and dissectors that took me quite a bit of time and also to, to yeah, understand that uh, doing the nodding outside is, is the most effective and more or less the only possible way to me to do this. But uh, as you see at this stage, the dura is pulsating, uh, which again is to me, to some extent, a sign that uh, it's watertight. Uh, and so I just, uh, for yeah, safety reasons, try to place another patch on the outside to, to even ensure it being watertight. Uh, so, and, you know, I think that was a really uh, important step there where you put the taco seal to push the fascicles back in and to serve as another barrier to allow you to 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 pass your needle safely. Um, I know one of the questions that people would have would, is that, you know, are you afraid of that taco seal migrating? But you obviously actually it looks like even in this particular case, a stitch goes through it, kind of anchors it underneath. So you get another barrier both on the inside and on the outside when you put your second piece down. Yeah, certainly. Uh, I think that is like where exactly you, you place your needle in uh, these edges of the door is not as controllable as doing it uh, microsurgically, where, of course, usually in your other hand, you have uh, different instruments to hold up these edges a little bit, which is not possible doing it this way. So to be really on the safe side and not uh, placing the needle through fascicles, I think it's utmost important to, to place any kind of uh, agent down there to, to make sure they are, they are pushed away. But uh, I've 
been taught to do it this way in microsurgery as well to where uh, it might improve the 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 closure or it being even more watertight by by placing this seal on the inside so i was just from the beginning on planning on on doing that with the benefit of as you say just pushing the fascicles uh, further down to to not have any risk of of uh, yeah stitching them up now yeah i mean i like i said i've i have never done this um, before and uh I just made my thoughts before the surgery so I could at least give it a try before I possibly had to move to microsurgery and uh, I've before I've never really encountered uh, this issue of where I had to do this and like I've mentioned before in in teaching beginners you always teach them when the, the defect is too big you have to convert to microsurgery but this of course just destroys all the benefits of uh, endoscopy and so of course it does take a certain amount of experience to be able to handle these instruments like that but uh, once this learning curve is passed this might be an option to close dura endoscopically without having to convert to microsurgery and again i think uh, technology has to advance there as well to where we have needle holders especially made for that instead of uh, like me using pituitaries right there but then this might be an option to within a reasonable amount of time close dura endoscopically without having to convert to microsurgery and as we have uh, said before it might not be necessary to really close it watertight because uh, just by adapting that the CSF loss will be minimal to where you don't have the issue of headache and uh, again the, the soft tissue uh, destruction is so little to where you don't have the risk of CSF migrating up to the skin causing infection either yeah I think that's a great point which is great ahead. well that's a wonderful uh a discourse on how to close the dura in multiple different ways. I'm particularly intrigued by the ability to close the dura with sutures because and that's was driven home to me during my residency. I always try to close uh, the dura whenever I can. Um, really, really wonderful technique. I think the take home messages uh, are that uh, you tie the knot outside of the endoscope and use a knot pusher uh, to push it down, and that you use something to push the fascicles away to allow you to um, safely pass the needle through both leaflets of the dura. So, a really great technique. And once again, you keep pushing the boundaries and, and pushing us, making all of us better. So hopefully uh, listeners and viewers will be able to utilize your techniques. So thank you very much for sharing this with us. Thank you, Paul. Once again, thanks for having me. And yeah, maybe, you know, we, we're doing workshops for beginners and and maybe this might be part of a workshop in the future to where even in in models in cadavers we start to practice dural sutures before we yeah encounter that in in as a complication in real patients i think that's a great idea especially for espinea which is um organization we're both part of for endoscopic teaching hopefully Mano, and uh we'll be watching this and say you know what that's a great idea <laughs> anyway exactly. yeah. thanks a lot thank you paul yeah, thanks for having me yep bye